Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? All right. Praise God. So we're here at the time of the latter rain, as far as I understand the Bible teaches. It's a time appointed for pouring out some of his Holy Spirit, and he wants to give us it. And I believe that um, we, should, we should have a prayer here and ask for it. And, uh, you know, I got some good news and bad news. It, it just depends what kind of frame of mind you're in. You know, if you really love the world, it's probably not very good news because you're probably not going to be here very much longer. I think there's a lot of things that are happening, and, you know, I think Jesus is coming very soon. So to most of us, hopefully it's good news, okay? <laughs> so let's have a prayer before we start. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Father, for the grace that you have towards us. We want to ask your spirit to be with us. Father, I want you to anoint my lips. Let them speak words that are spirit and that are life. Let this message come out clearly, Father. Not just, not just the words to come out clearly, but our minds to really receive these words and to truly be able to share it with others, Father. To share these things with others in a way that's going to convict them that the time is short and that Jesus is coming and that they, there's a time to repent and to be saved and to, uh, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to go and share it with others, Father. Because I know, Father, we want to reach as many people as we can before we get out of this world. We want to take as many as we can out of this world with us. So, Father, I just ask you, Father, to work through me and through all the others that are here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and thank you. Amen. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going to be doing a three-part series on spiritualism. This is part one of the series, and this one is called The Dragon and His Friends. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Satan and his angels. If we go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 9, we're told that the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And we're going to learn a lot about how he's deceiving the whole world, even within the church itself as God's people. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And we're going to look at how the angels, that's what this is going to be. It's going to be a study on angels because the devils come with the spirits. They're spirits of devils that are coming into these churches. They're working miracles. They're doing signs and all kinds of things are happening right now. And we need to have discernment. And we can tell how to have discernment. We're going to look at how to test this. We're just going to take a few, less, a few verses and go through a lesson here before we really get into this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and 14 tells us, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So if Satan is transformed into an angel of light, and his ministers are, then we should be careful to discern. There's got to be a way to discern these things. Now, Ephesians 5, verses 8 to 11 tells us that we were sometimes in darkness. But now are we in the light in the Lord? And he tells us, walk as children in the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them or expose them, it says in other versions. And that's what we want to do. We want to just, I know the devil, he comes in many ways. He has many snares. And we have entire chapters and books that are dedicated to these things that show us that the devil is working in many ways. And we need to have discernment to see the snares that he's laid out for us. Hebrews chapter 1, 7 and 4 now, there's some symbols that are used in prophecy. Angels, it talks about angels here. It says, The angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of flame of fire. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now, these would be kind of the opposite kind of spirits. And they're also called flames of fire. Prophecy talks about fire coming down from heaven. We talk about that in prophecy. And um, we're going to see a connection here as we continue with the angels. You'll notice here when um, the, John the Revelator received the revelation of Jesus Christ, it says God gave it unto him. And it says to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So how does God usually come to give us and show us things that are shortly to come to pass? That's how he does it. He sends his angel to us. We can't see sometimes, 
or, but we hear that still small voice and that's how God speaks to us, by his angels. But is there other angels that are coming to us and giving us messages, trying to speak? But we can test these spirits because angels are spirits. Revelation 1, 2 tells us that this one, we can, this, this angel here bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus and of all things that he saw. So this angel has the testimony of Jesus Christ. And what again is the testimony of Jesus Christ? We most, most of us know what it is in Revelation 19, 10. We're told, I fell at his feet to worship him, John, regarding the angel. And the angel said to him, see thou do it not. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So we need to try these spirits. Notice also that this angel is considered to be a prophet. It says it right here, verse 22, 22 verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. So if this is a prophet of God, of his brethren the prophets here, one of these angels, then what would the fallen angels be? False prophets. Spirits, false prophets, right? Now, prophecy is to show people things to come, Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. In the book of John 16, verse 13 and 14, and this is John, the one who received the revelation, it says that when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you in all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, who came to show John things to come in Revelation 1.1? 1, 1? It was his angel, right? The angel, the spirit. When the spirit comes, he's going to show you things to come. So the angel was that spirit because an angel is a ministering spirit. And did he glorify Christ? Did he speak of himself or did he glorify Christ? It was the revelation of Jesus Christ. He wasn't speaking of himself when he came to give him the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's showing about Christ. And he's teaching him things that were shortly to come to pass. It says in verse 14, he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine, shall show it to you. So John knew that that spirit was coming to him, and it did. The spirit came and spoke to him and showed him the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he wants to come and speak to us as well, because what's sent to each church? An angel, right? And what at the end of each church, it says, hear what the spirit saith to the church. God has his messengers, whether they're people or angels. That's how he sends his messengers, is, his, is through his people and through his angels. Now notice here, it says the angel didn't speak of himself to John. Revelation of Jesus Christ. The angel was showing John what was to come. He's showing him the future. The angel was a ministering spirit. The angel had the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. The angel himself was a prophet. And it's called the spirit of truth. In 1 John 4, 1, it tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So remember, what is an angel again? It can be a prophet, right? And an angel can also be the spirit of truth. What's the opposite of the spirit of truth? What's the opposite of truth? How about error? Truth, error? Verse 2 says, Hereby know ye the spirit of God. So you're going to know it. Let's read verse 6. It says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So we know it, right? We know the spirit of God, verse 2, and we know the spirit of truth, every spirit that doesn't speak of himself, which is confessing Jesus Christ, whether it be an angel or whether it be a person that's confessing that Christ has come in the flesh. When the spirit of truth has come, he's going to teach you things to come. John 16. Now, in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19 and 20, it says, When they shall say to you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? Should we go to seek dead people and ask them for things? We know about this kind of stuff, right? This is spiritualism. We're going to look at this as we continue. But these are the angels, the fallen angels. They're familiar spirits. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we can try the spirits by the word of God and by the law 
and by the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, to the law and to the testimony. These angels, if they don't have that testimony, which came to John, then we're going to know them. Now, this is a video from Bethel Church. It's Bill Johnson. He's a very famous pastor. And um, I want to just show you guys a little bit of this. Now, I understand that some people, it may be fearful, but we got to realize that Jesus paid the price for these people as well, okay? And he loves them, and he cares about them. There's no fear in love. So none of us should be in fear, 1 John 4.18. We should be willing to say, wow, you know what? These people might be in bondage, but we want to help these people as God's people. Isn't that what we're called to do, right? Cast out devils, heal the sick. That was the message that Jesus gave when he left. But let's take a look here, and we'll, we'll know the spirit as we continue. <laughs> All of this footage comes from within Bethel itself. Obviously, as you can see, they're into spreading this drunkenness anointing, just like the others we've looked at. For years, Bill's wife, Benny Johnson, has been the senior co-pastor of Bethel alongside her husband. And this woman is into some truly weird new agey stuff. Benny Johnson herself put out this picture. She's lying soaking on C.S. Lewis's grave. These are students from Bethel's School of Ministry, and they've been photographed around the world lying on the graves of dead Christian leaders. There's a teaching in some of these circles that you can soak up the anointing by lying on their graves. Here's Bill Johnson himself at the grave of the wife of Smith Wigglesworth, the famous healing evangelist. All right, so that's only a little bit of some of the stuff that's going on in these churches. But if they're seeking to the dead, as it says, the living to the dead in Isaiah 8, 19, what spirit is going to come to them and speak to them? It's not the spirit of God. We know it's not the spirit of God to the law and to the testimony. These spirits are seeking to the dead. Try the spirits, 1 John 4, 1. We can know that definitely this is not the spirit of God. These are fallen angels, spirits of devils. Now, in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, it says, The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more of a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So if he's saying that he sees dead people, I don't know if anybody's seen this movie. This is an old movie. This is before I was a Christian. But Sixth Sense, he, used to, he said, I see dead people. There was dead people walking around in the video, and he was looking at them. Obviously, if we see dead people or speak to dead people, these are not the Spirit of God. Now, this is, um, this is a video called How to Talk to Dead People here, and it's getting thousands and thousands of views on YouTube. And there's hundreds and hundreds of videos like this. And I know all kinds of people that are getting into this stuff. This stuff is exploding everywhere. And then on the, on the right side, you can see the same woman over on the right side there, and it says how to speak in tongues, right? So they're speaking in tongues, talking to dead people. It all works together. If you continue, you look down the list here, and this is attractive to people because, like, as you can see up here on the top, this little girl says, I want to talk to my dad, right? And what person, if they really didn't, would really love to talk to their parents if they didn't know any better what the scripture said. They would want to talk to their grandpa or grandma or parents, right? They're sad because p probably their parents are missing. So what's the devil going to be able to do in a situation like this? He's going to take advantage of these poor people who don't know any better. And it's, it's all over the internet. It's everywhere. Now, as you can see on the right, you look on the right, it says five signs your angels are near you. Five signs your, your spirit wants to talk to you. These are all videos online and stuff like that. How to awaken your psychic abilities. What happens to your spirit when you die? One hour spell hypnosis. Are you a medium? Here's how to know. How to do automatic writing. All kinds of videos like these things are online. So there's a lot of spiritualism spreading. But this is the obvious stuff, right? This is the obvious stuff. One, one person talked to a lady, uh, the lady of Salette, and she said to honor Sundays, in God's name. We can know that one by the word to the law and to the testimony, right? It speaks not according to this word. So this is definitely not any saint or anything like that. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 and 11 tells us plainly, there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire that uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch 
or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. A necromancer means they talk to the dead. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more tomorrow. But um, I want to talk a little bit about Pentecost and some things that are going on here. This spirit is definitely not from God. The, the spirit, that's a, there's a counterfeit of what happened on Pentecost, the spirit that I was talking about in those videos and stuff. But um, this is a quote from Ellen White. She says that on the day of Pentecost, it says, when the truth in its simplicity is lived in every place, then God will work through his angels as he worked on the day of Pentecost. So remember when that wind came down on the day of Pentecost and the fire from heaven? That's God working through his angels. That's the wind, the Holy Spirit. That's how he comes to his church, through his angels. And that's how he speaks to his people. So we read it ab about it in Acts chapter 2 here. It says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this is a fire here, and this fire is coming from heaven. And when we think of prophecy, there's prophecy like, it talks about Elijah and fire from heaven. Elijah was a prophet. He had the spirit of prophecy. And there's several gifts, and I'm just going to look at these in one sec. But Acts 2.8 says, How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own language? This is not just a gibberish that no one can understand. This is the actual languages of these people and where they're from. They understood them in their own languages. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 tells us, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And there's kind of an order there, firstly, secondly, thirdly, etc., until you get down to the last one, which is diversity of tongues. And three of these I want you to remember, prophecy, miracles, and tongues. These are important to remember. Now, healings are also happening in these movements as well. But um, 1 Corinthians 14, 6, he says, Brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? In other words, what profit is it if I don't have something to teach you? Is it any good if I just come with just a bunch of babbling and you don't understand, you don't know what to do? Prophecy is given so that we can take heed, we can do something about it, it says. If we don't have prophecy, we're like a bunch of people in a dark place. That's what the Bible says in 2 Peter 1. If we don't have prophecy, we need to understand prophecy so that we can take heed. Has anybody ever heard of the Azusa Street Revivals? Some of you have, right? Now, this is from a Los Angeles Times newspaper article. It's from April 18th, 1906, and you can see the title here, Weird Babble of Tongues. New sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Wild scene last, year, last night at Azusa Street. Gurgle of wordless talk by a sister. Now, this was a, a reformation of a sort, 1905, and I just want to break down this a little bit because this all applies to prophecy right now. We're going to look at how this all applies to the last prophecies that are about to take place. Now, Azusa Street is, a, is in Los Angeles, California, USA. The church there experienced a phenomenon in the early 1900s. Charles Parham, remember that name, has the distinction of being the father of modern Pentecostalism and charismaticism. His contemporary... W.J. Seymour helped to spread the new theology and manifestations. So there's Parham and Seymour, the fathers basically of the movement of charismaticism in the United States. This is where it came from. But listen to what Charles Parham says, okay? It says, Charles Parham saw hypno hypno hypnotists practicing hypnotism at the altar. Later he confessed that it was all of Satan. So the father of this movement says... Later, it was all of Satan. That's, he's basically calling his own movement satanic, the founder of the movement. He says, hypnotic influences, familiar spirit influence, spiritualistic influences, mesmeric influences, and all kinds of spells and spasms, falling in trances, etc. These are the types of things. Also, the other founder, W.J. Seymour, 
ultimately repudiated the initial evidence teaching speaking in tongues as providing an open door for witches and spiritualists and free loveism. Now, some of you have read the Spirit of Prophecy. You might know some and have heard some of these words before. But that was what the other founder said. So do these guys sound like they were very confident after they saw a little bit of what was happening? Sounds like they kind of turned on their own movement. This is another one. Uh, it says, The spiritualists and mediums from the numerous occult societies of Los Angeles began to attend and to contribute their seances and trances to the services. So <laughs> it ended up being a free-for-all for all the, the witches, right? The witches started coming into it. Now, these are some of the problematic behaviors at these meetings. While slain in the spirit, people unconsciously stripped or exhibited lewd behavior. Special patrols discouraged lascivious activities around the camp perimeters because they were a little bit active and crazy. People, while slain in the spirit, writhed and barked and howled. And this is, this is for real. I've like my mom used to go to these churches as well when I was a kid. That's where I found, I, I used to go to these churches and I would see it for myself. They'd be lying on the floor and barking and yelling and screaming and it was like they were possessed and I just thought they were crazy. I didn't really believe in any of it at the time because I was just a kid, but I thought they were all crazy. I didn't, even, I didn't take them seriously and I kind of just, I don't know, I fell away for a long time after that. But these Azusa Street meetings also had problems with mediums, familiar spirits, controlling church meetings. So they're familiar spirits. Um, Seymour was terrified by these activities which took place in the middle of his church's service. He wrote frantically to Parham, begging him to come to Los Angeles to sort things out. W.J. Seymour was still writing urgent letters appealing for help as spiritualistic manifestations, hypnotic forces, and fleshly contortions as known in the colored camp meetings in the South had broken loose in these meetings. Now, has anybody ever heard of the Toronto Blessing? I, uh, my mom went to that too. And um, the Toronto Blessing was the product of South African evangelist Rodney Howard Brown, laughing revival crusades. The phenomenon included infectious laughter, spasms, resting in the spirit, and a variety of noises that some describe as sounding like animals. Now, there was a lot of stuff happening. I was seeing a lot of this stuff because I was around it a little bit in the, when the Toronto Blessing was there. And um, that is Rodney Howard Brown over on the right with the elephant, but it's also Rodney Howard Brown on the right. And do you guys know who the other guy is with Rodney Howard Brown there? It's, it's actually um, Kenneth Copeland. Yeah, Kenneth Copeland is a charismatic minister and he's another one that has a lot of these tongues teachings and stuff. And if you guys remember what happened in 2014 about the Catholic Charismatic Alliance between Pope Francis. And so there's a connection between all these guys. As you, you put it all together, it's like, you know, Cope works for the Pope. Pope works for so, you know, it all will connect a few more dots as we continue here, right? Um, I got a video here I just want to show you. It's a few minutes long. But um, this is just on, uh, this was right after the meetings, right after those meetings with, with uh, Tony Palmer in 2014. This is from a sermon. Whoops. I pressed the wrong button. Glory to God. Somebody shout amen. amen. Now I got some things I want to show you here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. If you'll watch these screens, please. The Protestant Reformation could also be known as one of the largest church splits in history. Notice what where took the split place in 1521 from. when Martin Luther was excommunicated from the Catholic Church opened wide the doors to the spirit of division. Who's the divider? Since that time, true unity in the church has been nearly unheard of. With denomination after denomination and church split after church split, Jesus' prayer that we all may be one has seemed to be almost unattainable. Following the 1901 Pentecostal outpouring, a revival began in 1906 on Azusa, Azusa Street, bringing real and lasting changes in the lives of those whose hearts were touched. The now worldwide charismatic movement currently includes approximately 700 million people 
of whom 160 million are Catholics. This charismatic renewal grew from small prayer groups into national and international conferences. The magnitude of change that was to come because of this openness to and welcoming of the Holy Spirit was not initially known. By the Holy Spirit's great work, those 500-year-old divisional walls are coming down around the world. 500 Christians years. from all denominations, divisional races, walls. and languages are joining together and again becoming the body of Christ. It is now that we all must They're all come one body. the unity of our faith that the world may know that we are his disciples. Somebody ought to shout amen. Can, it was a pope that invoked faith and asked God for a new Pentecost. That's where it came from. Now, somebody said, well, is Copeland turning Catholic? No. They asked Pope Francis, uh, are you, do, do you think, do, do you think these, these people should convert? And he shouted, no, that would be wrong. We're coming together in the unity of our faith, not the unity of our religions. Man. Hallelujah. Oh, they, I'm telling you, folks, this is just absolutely huge. And I'll tell you why. The, the spirit of division is behind all racism. Yes. Division, racism. Racism is not just skin color or ethnic background. Let me give you this statement because I've and got a little division? thing here to show you. I don't want to, and if I get turned loose on this, I'm. <laughs> okay, yeah, he goes. Anyway, Luther is the cause of the division here, and the Protestant Reformation is the cause of these divisions. So, in order to heal the divisions, which are called wounds of division, as we'll continue then the Lutherans have to kind of join up. And what's happening on October 31st this year? Does anybody know about the, the big signing? But in 1999, some of this was already signed. They agree that the protest is over in 1999. The end of the, the, mm -hmm. the, of the 500 years is this year, right? That's this year, October 31st. Now, I want to bring some prophecy in here. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. A behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And I've shared some of this before, but I'm just going to summarize quickly. Seven crowns represent pagan Rome. And um, first application is obviously the dragon is the devil and Satan. We know this. But there's a secondary application because a beast in prophecy is a kingdom. And in this kingdom here, when he tried to devour the child, it says he, the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. It's very similar to Revelation 12, 17, where he's wroth with the woman. He's wroth with the woman. Herod was exceeding wroth with the woman, right? And sent forth, slew all the children of Bethlehem. He's definitely wroth with the children, the seed. And so there's an application here, which is a secondary application, which is pagan Roman Empire. He tried to destroy that's the application of this beast here, this great red dragon in Revelation 12. Now we go to Revelation 13. It says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and this one has ten crowns. This has the whole empire, all horns, not just seven like the dragon. Seven plus three is ten. It took over the rest of the kingdom. And verse 2 says, The beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were the feet of a bear. His mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. I want to talk about this power for a sec. Because who gives the power to the papacy? The dragon, which would have been through the Emperor Justinian, Imperial Rome. The state power gives its power to the church. Church and state power right here. And there's going to be an image of this, because the the image of the beast exercises all the same power. So the dragon gives him his power, seat, and authority. That's a woman riding a beast. Doesn't the woman sit on a beast? She gets her power from the dragon, Satan. 
Revelation 13.5, a red beast, right? Not a leopard-like beast. Revelation 13.5 says, There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given him to continue 40 and two months. So that power was given in 538, Emperor Justinian, the Justinian Code. And that lasted till 1798, that power. And uh, so you can see here on my little chart with uh, Pagan Rome, seven crowns till 538, the ten crowns till 1798. Now there's another beast right around 1798 that comes out of the earth. Verse 11, it says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And that dragon, he just seems to be coming up everywhere, doesn't he? So America. Now remember, when America was founded, there was something very important, very critical, a wall of separation. Thomas Jefferson says, erecting the wall of separation between the church and the state is absolutely essential in a free society. So if you guys desire freedom in America, what's absolutely essential? This wall has to be there. Now, some people say, well, the founders never set up a wall between separation and church and state. That's not what comes out of their mouths. James Madison was the founder of the Constitution. And he's the father of the Constitution, they call him. He says the purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. They knew a little bit about what happened over there in the Dark Ages. 50 to 100 million killed, and all in the name of Jesus, apparently. They misused his name, blasphemed his name. That's what it says in Revelation 13, verse 6, I believe. But verse 12, it says, He exercised all the power of the first beast before him. And what kind of power was that again? The power of the church and the state. The power that was given by the dragon. So where is this power going to come from? It's the power of the first beast. It's going to come from the dragon, Satan's power. He's the one who comes to you and says, Here, here's all the kingdoms of this world. Right? He was the one who came to Jesus. Jesus was the head of the church. And um, he caused all to worship he caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly one was healed, which is the papacy. So what's going to happen in America is they're going to point us back to the papacy. Now I know some of you understand a lot about this. You've probably seen this newspaper article before about the wounded many years. This was in 1929 when the Lateran Treaty was signed. But there was only a little bit of power given here, wasn't there? There wasn't very much power. There was a lot more power to be given to the papacy. There wasn't much state power offered, but there was a little bit given. There was more to come. You guys are familiar with what happened on September 23rd, the Day of Atonement, Judgment Day 2015. The woman was riding the beast. She was going to the kings of the earth. That's what it says in Revelation 17, 1 and 2. And this was never thought possible. This is the first religious leader to ever speak through the Congress of the United States to the lawmakers, right? These are the lawmakers here, reaching over, grasping the hand of the papacy. Unfortunately, it's supposed to be a Protestant government. Now, let me just let me just play a little clip here. We must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism, whether religious or of any other kind. The contemporary war. Everybody see that? With Fundamentalism, open Protestantism. Wounds, open wounds. Which affects so many of our brothers and sisters. Now it's time for America to bind the wounds of division. division. Have to get together. Demands that we confront every form of polarization. That divides. Which, well, which would divide it into peace. Comes. Wounds, wounds of division. And what does the Bible say about a deadly wound? It said the wound would be healed, right? So the wound of many years was to be healed. And what was the cause of the division again? Do you guys remember? It was the Protestants protesting against the papacy. It was a Protestant government in America. That's what the spirit of prophecy teaches in the great controversy. It's not protesting anymore. Now, when we look up the word fundamentalism, it says a form of religion, especially Islam or Protestant Christianity. And the Pope says we must be especially on the lookout for fundamentalists. Look out for Protestants who uphold a strict literal interpretation. Now, spiritualism 
is at war with the plainest statements in the Scripture. If anybody's read that in the Great Controversy, you might be familiar with that quote. But after 500 years, Europe's Reformation scars have all but healed, study finds. And there's a lot of articles like this online you'll find about healing. And there's a healing taking place. That healing is between the Protestants or so-called Protestants and the papacy. There's not really a protest anymore of what happened. And just a little bit of what, ha- what Protestantism is, where did it come from? In 1521, Luther was outlawed. His books, his life by the Edict of Worms. In 1530, the princes stood up to the emperor. They protested against the Edict of the Papacy and a compromise was made to allow religious liberty. That was the protest. That's in the Great Controversy and there's a lot more on that in that book. It's a really good book. But these protesters against the Pope and his state-enforced decrees, they were come to be known as Protestants. That's where Pro- Protestantism comes, comes from. And just briefly, I want to look at the false prophet in Revelation 13. It says, He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. Was there any prophet that made fire come down from heaven or had, was associated with fire from heaven? Elijah, right, Elijah. So this would probably be a counterfeit of Elijah. Would you say that bringing fire down from heaven, he's going to counterfeit the spirit of prophecy, the spirit that prophesies? What else is this part of the spirit? Miracles, um, tongues. These are, part, these are the fruit of the spirit. So there's fire to come down from heaven. It's going to be a counterfeit. Like on the day of Pentecost, there was fire in the form of tongues. And let's just look at Tony Palmer and see what he's saying here. I believe that God has brought me here to this year's Ministers Conference in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers and to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons. And I've understood that the spirit of Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation. You're going to have to come to the wedding. I will. I'm available. Praise God. God's will be done. Amen. Tony, thank you, sir. My, how you bless this place tonight. Thank you. Okay. So they're definitely, they're definitely bringing the fathers and the children together. Or, or is it, you know, the mother and her children, right? But let's look at this next one here just briefly. Fire from heaven. This is just brief. I just wanted to show just... That that's exactly what this is. It's a counterfeit fire. Fire! Fire! fire. Brooklyn, shake him, Jesus. Rodney Howard Brown. New Jersey. Fire. Any workers? Workers. <laughs> and Rodney Howard Brown is in this for a reason. I'll show you why in a second. But this is definitely not the spirit of God. Here. This is Babylon. Babbling on, right? Now, just briefly, I just there's a comparison. I'm just going to show you a video here. Why are these the manifestations so similar to Eastern religions and Hinduism and the Kundalini cults? And yet they're not found in scripture, they're not found in the Bible, they're not found in classical Christianity at all. <laughs> um, I'm going to continue on just because of the fact that there's a lack of time. There's, but I want to, uh, if you, anybody wants the PowerPoint, they can ask me. I'll be happy to give it to you guys, okay? So anyways, I want to continue on. I want to get through this prophecy here. But Revelation 13, 14, and it's the same spirit. And what they do is it's called the Kundalini spirit. When they lay hands on the person, that person receives that spirit. And this is important because you're going to see something in a second. And I'm show you something that just happened about a week, two weeks ago, maybe. But Revelation 13, 14, He deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. So there's a lot of miracles that are happening in these churches. And people are seeing these things, and then they're saying, let's make an image or a copy of what the papacy was during the Dark Ages, exercising the same power, the church and state power. Great Controversy tells us that in order for the United States to form an image to the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. That's Great Controversy, page 443. So that power, she has to control 
The religious power has to control the state. So that means the state has to give the power to the religious churches. Again, he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. Caused the earth and dwell, them that dwell therein to worship the papacy, right? Whose deadly wound was healed. Great Controversy, page 442, says a lamb like horns and dragon voice of the symbol point to a striking contradiction between the professions and practice of the nation thus represented. The speaking of the nation. What's it going to speak like, everybody? Like a dragon. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. Great Controversy, page 442. So who are the legislative and lawmaking authorities in America? It's the Congress of the United States. Those are the people where the Pope came to speak to, right? And he's telling them, you guys got to be on the watch for uh, these Protestants, right? The legal authorities, the legislative authorities, the judges. Now, that's called, we call Washington the heart of the nation. You can see this, this is an old video called Heart of the Nation, Washington, D.C. And you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if it's going to speak like a dragon, it's got to come out of the heart. That's biblical, right? And the heart of the nation would be Washington, D.C. Now, that's where, where the Shekinah glory is supposed to be, right? And if the Shekinah glory is removed, the Spirit leaves it. What did Jesus say when the Shekinah glory was taken out of the most holy place? It was desolate. It was empty. So this beast could be desolate. It could be empty. Now, Revelation 13, again, we looked at this one already. He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from him. He wants to do these things. But Donald Trump named 34 members to his council of Catholic advisors recently. Do you think that, um, the, that he needs a 34 Catholic advisors? Do you think that's going to help him to do the work to be a Protestant, a good Protestant government? Is that going to be a good Protestant government there with 34 Catholic advisors? Yeah, you're not even protesting. It's not Protestant anymore. Who's who of Trump's faith advisors, tremendous faith advisors? He's got 30-something of them as well, including men like Kenneth Copeland and Rodney Howard Brown. These are some of his faith advisors as well. Now, I just want to briefly look at what happened back in 2014, just remind you guys of what the agenda was. Now, this is one and a half billion Catholics and half a billion Charismatics. This is a quarter of the world's population in these two groups coming together. So this is a big event. This is, this is not a small thing. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. But we are reformed. We are Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of... All right. Just, just so you know, 1999, the protest is over apparently, right? Now, this is just after. There's another video done. He's saying again the protest is over. But notice what he calls the people who still protest. Listen carefully. We may be living officially in a post-Protestant era. But many Christians today continue to suffer from spiritual racism. So what are the, what are the Protestants? They're called racists. Does that sound familiar to what Kenneth Copeland was saying earlier with regards to Luther and the Protestants, right? They're, they're racist, okay? But not just that, but listen to this one here. And listen to carefully what he thinks needs to be done to get rid of spiritual racism. The first step in dealing with spiritual racism is to abolish the law which empowers it. Okay, so there must be a law that empowers you to be a Protestant. Freedom of religion, right? The First Amendment of the United States Congress. And so what, because there's, there's not like, it's not like he's saying we need to make a law to protect us all. He's saying we need to abolish a law. There's a law that's in the way of us doing what we want to do. And that law is none other than Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of the religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or, or, or the freedom, abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble to petition the government for redress of grievances. 
And if you're familiar with the great controversy in several places, it talks about the Constitution of the United States being the secret to America's prosperity, to the freedom that we have. If we don't have this law, we don't have the rights that we had. This is what it makes America free. And as Thomas Jefferson said, he knew what he was doing when they put these things in, that absolute freedom could not come unless we had this law in the Constitution. So if there's a law that needs to be abolished, and he's going to Congress, and Congress is, what are they to uphold in Congress? They're to uphold the Constitution. That's what they're elected to do. They're elected to protect your freedoms, to protect your rights, to keep you free. And what are they doing if they're, if they're letting the Pope come and sit on the heart of the beast? He's sitting in the most holy place, sitting where he ought not, isn't he? Right? He's sitting in a place where the Most High is supposed to dwell. He's sitting in a temple, you know, of the beast. He's sitting on the heart of the nation, the heart. And um, I think we need to take a notice here. This is something pretty serious. And we'll look at this We've a little bit more. We've allowed the devil to come in and take over every realm of society and the church has done absolutely very little about it. <clears throat> because we were told it's not our duty. We were told separation of church and state, which is a bunch of garbage. The separation of church and state is to keep the government from sticking its nose in the church. Yeah, it's to keep the church. People from don't even power. know the history of this great country. Do we know the history? Probably not very good. <laughs> A lot of us don't, right? Because if we did, we'd know that this guy is definitely not telling us the truth. You know, and he's speaking in Constitution Hall to a lot of people, and he's going to the government. This is Rodney Howard Brown here. I'm going to show you something about Rodney Howard Brown here in a second as we continue, but you see this picture right here? You'll never guess whose Facebook this appeared on. Rodney Howard Brown's Facebook about a week and a half ago, and whose hand do you think is right on his back there? It's Rodney Howard Brown's. And what was I talking about with the hands? I wanted to show you the Kundalini stuff and stuff like that, but what, and, and that shack teapot and all that kind of stuff, what is he imparting what kind of spirit do you think it is? Do you think it's a spirit, the lamb-like spirit, maybe that he's trying to put into them, as it's going to bring no fire from heaven or nothing like that? Is this like the fire in Acts chapter 2, or is this the fire in Revelation 13? What do you think the spirit is that he's trying to put into Donald Trump? Yeah, yeah. And this is one of his advisors, right? This is right on the front. Great spiritual awakening. Pastors lay hands on Donald Trump in the Oval Office. And this is right after he prayed. Just a quick video here. I only got a little part of this. You see the news media talking about the president, that the whole White House is up in arms and that. Well, we found a very relaxed President Trump, and I've met him on quite a number of occasions. I saw him just the same even before he was elected. He was just President Trump. There's a lot of people freaking out because, oh, my God, they prayed in, in the Oval Office, separation of church and state. That's bogus. There's no such thing as separation of church and state. You see? You see where this is going? And he, these are his religious advisors. Does Trump know the Bible? Trump doesn't know what he's doing. If he knows anything, well, he might. I don't know his heart. I don't know what he knows because there's a lot of things he might know. He could be really know that there's an agenda here. He could be behind some of it. But in, this is a religious liberty order here. He signed a religious liberty order just recently that promotes religious liberty, tolerance, and anti-bullying. And this is just a video here. Yet for too long, the federal government has used the power of the state as a weapon against people of faith, bullying and even punishing Americans for following their religious beliefs. That's been happening. That is why I am signing today an executive order to defend the freedom of religion and speech in America, the freedoms that we've wanted, the freedoms that you fought for so long, and we are doing it in just a little while right over here. Now, a lot of people are saying, thank God. Today, my administration is leading by example as we take historic steps to protect religious liberty in the United States of America. <clears throat> We will not allow people of faith to be targeted, bullied, or silenced anymore. He's going to protect religious liberty. And we will never, ever stand 
for religious discrimination. Never, ever. <laughs> Tolerance is the cornerstone yes. of peace. And that is why I am proud to make a major and historic announcement this morning and to share with you that my first foreign trip as President of the United States will be to Saudi Arabia, then Israel, and then to a place that my cardinals love very much, Rome. Rome. Well, that's the place you go when you want to spread religious liberty, right? If anybody knows anything about tolerance and anti-bullying, the Pope would be the man to talk to you about that, you know? That's definitely... <laughs> he, I don't know if he's on the right track. He's got a few people standing behind him. But just this is just some history, okay? Has anybody ever heard of the Edict of Milan? In AD 313, it says in the right corner, I want you to look up the right corner right there. It says, the Edict of Milan proclaimed by Roman Emperor Constantine and Licenti Licinius bestowed tolerance for Christianity and other religions. Tolerance, you know, no more bullying these Christians, okay? And in AD 313, it says an executive order was signed by Constantine similar to the executive order that Donald Trump just signed. Constantine's order was called the Edict of Milan, which according to wikipedia.com was a law ordering the people of the Roman Empire to treat Christians benevolently within the Roman Empire. Constantine was considered to be a really good Christian. You know, Pope Trump says he's a really good Christian, right? He said that to the Pope because the Pope didn't think he was. But who really helped to give power back to the church? He's considered to be a really good Christian who give power back to the church. I got two videos and if anybody wants these DVDs, I'm giving them away. And um, they're just movies that I made on these issues. They're about Trump, the church, the state, and then walls of unity. And you guys can get them. Just ask me for them. But this is great controversy, page 449. It says, The nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing. Is there a lot of great rejoicing happening right now? Because Trump is on the Christian side. And the world, cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now the work of corruption progressed rapidly. It didn't slow down. It didn't help anything. He didn't just save the Christians. Now Constantine, continuing, 53, great controversy. She says, in the early part of the 4th century, the emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival. So what's, what's following? Yeah, it was, the, it was down at the bottom, the yellow part. It was the emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism. We gotta, we gotta bind the wounds of division, right? If I'm president, Christianity will have power in the US, Donald Trump. Now, what's that word power mean? Remember, the government, religious power, controlling the government, great controversy, 443. Donald Trump promises evangelicals great power, higher church attendance. What kind of power do you think this is? This is maybe this is the, all the power of the first beast before him? Similar? Is he going to exercise all the power of the first beast? United States? If we have eyes to see and we understand these prophecies, if we've read the great controversy a few times, we know what this is about. And I'm not saying Donald Trump is the last president. I don't know. It could be Mike Pence. It could be someone else. But I'm just saying this is the direction. This is what's happening here. Now, What's inevitable in this situation? Great Controversy 292 says a kind of state and church was formed, the magistrates being authorized to suppress heresy. Thus, secular power was in the hands of the church. It was not long before these measures led to the inevitable result, persecution. So what is this all leading to? It's inevitable. Inevitable. Now, President Trump signs a declaration making Sunday a national day of prayer. That's all great but what is he doing why are the why is the church trying to get power over this president what are they trying to do what's the order here he could have just as easily signed a sunday law into effect and said hey we're going to take over here because he can uh, he's signing these executive orders but here's another one charismatic leaders call for national prophetic re repentance on 9 11 and just just to read a little bit of these leaders these so-called you know spiritual leaders that he's got guiding him. He said, what the enemy did with offensive in the 2001 9-11 attack, we're going to turn it around, make offensive for the spirit on September 11, 2017. Don Black, president and CEO of Cornerstone Television Network, tells Charisma News, this is a counterattack. The day has been laid here for the last 15, 16 years. 
What we've asked President Trump to do is to make it a national day of prayer, fasting, and repentance. This has not happened for 100 years. So you're going to sign a, like a thing that calls for repentance. into like, It's not a law, but it's still. You don't get the president to sign things like this. There's no need to put this on new, in paper by a president. Um, but he did do what they asked. He did three days of prayer. He went above and beyond what they asked. You know, So this is definitely a president who's out to help these people. Here's another one of his advisors, Robert Jeffries. God has given Trump authority to take out Kim Jong-un. And, you know, this is not the kind of spirit. This is the kind of spirit that's behind it. It's a spirit of whosoever doesn't agree with you should die, right? He said also, he said, Trump evangelical advisor said, NFL kneelers are lucky they aren't shot in the head. Same guy. So what's the spirit behind these kind of guys? You know, bow or else. That's the spirit. Whosoever should not worship should be killed. That's going to be the spirit behind it. Now, Donald Trump, remember he used his first foreign trip to unite religionists against extremism? Well, that's exactly what Pope Francis is doing, urging world religions to fight extremism. Why do they need to unite all these religions? What's it all about? And not just extremism, Pope says fundamentalism too, which is the Protestants. I hope you're still a Protestant. We're supposed to protest against these kind of things. We've got to stand up for truth and protest. What did A.T. Jones do in, in 1900? What kept the sun? He's an American hero. He saved this name. We wouldn't be here right now if he didn't do it. So we need to, we need to learn our history and understand where we're, what we're supposed to do, where, we're, where we are right now. But Protestant Christianity. Now I've got one last quote here to read. And this is a great controversy, 588 and 89. It says, As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. Satan determines to unite them in one body. Is that not what Kenneth Copeland was saying? One church? And thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. So what's the name of this one body? Spiritualism. That's the name of the church of Satan. Spiritualism. Papists are going to be in there who boast the miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power. Protestants, having cast away the shield of truth, will also be deluded. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will accept the form of godliness without the power, and this, they will see this union, this threefold union, a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. So what, what's it all about? Uniting Protestants, um, Papists, and worldlings, all three of them into like a threefold union. It's mentioned. We'll talk about it more in the next one. Yeah, we'll look at that more as we continue. But it's the beast, it's the false prophet, and it's Satan and his angels and the worldlings, which is the dragon. And that's in Revelation 16, 13. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, and they're going to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them, to make war on the saints, to battle in that great day of God Almighty. Spirits of devils. And there's miracles being worked here. What does a frog capture its prey with? Its tongue, right? And this is exactly what's happening here. These people are being captured by these spirits of devils. And we need to keep them in prayer, but we also need to expose these works and point out that the prophecies are being fulfilled. And of a truth, we do have it. We do have it. Prophecy is given. We have a sure word of prophecy. And it's been spoken. It's been given to us. So let's just close in a prayer and um, come back later. (coughs) 
Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Father, for your graciousness. We thank you, Father, for the word that you give to us, the spirit also, Father, that you want to pour out into us. Father, we ask for more of it. We pray, Father, that each one, as we see the times coming short, that we would all get into our Bibles and truly search like we never have before. Putting the time in the evening, in the morning, on the Sabbath, new moons, and holy days as well, so that we might have that Holy Spirit. Father, this is a time to receive of your outpourings of your Holy Spirit, Father, as well as those times. And we want to receive large outpourings. We want to understand the doctrines that you've given us, Father. We know also that there's another spirit that's going forth and it's moving quickly through this world. Father, we pray, Father, that you would give us a spirit to be able to reach these people, Father. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen.